Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce our two guests who will be talking about their book that has just come out on Tom Foley, The Man in the Middle. Um, uh, and uh, for those of you who are interested, we'll also have a book signing in the, in the front room here after the event where you can purchase a book and have it signed by the authors. So now let me introduce the two authors. John Pierce is Vice Chancellor and Professor Emeritus at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He's also the former director of the Oregon Historical Society, and he previously served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, here at WSU, as well as Chair of the Political Science Department here. And not to give away his age, he hired me as an assistant professor 33 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so that tells you a little bit about his longevity. Uh, John has co-authored or authored or co-edited approximately 20 books and monographs and more than 150 scholarly articles over his career. He has received numerous awards and honors, including the Mortar Board Dis uh, Distinguished Professor. He was also selected as an American Political Science Congressional Fellow. And just yesterday, he received WSU's Distinguished Alumni Award. And that was a terrific event for those of you who were there. Uh, his co-author for, uh, for this book is Kenton Bird. Ken is a professor emeritus at the School of Journalism and Mass Media at the University of Idaho. He holds a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Idaho and his PhD from here at WSU, where he wrote his dissertation on the political career of Tom Foley. So that's how he got involved in all this Foley stuff. Um, during his 15-year career as a reporter and editor, Kenton worked for newspapers in Moscow, Lewiston, Sandpoint, and Kellogg and as summer working for the Washington Post. In 1989, he was chosen as a congressional fellow by the American Political Science Association, and he's worked as a congressional staff member in Washington, D.C. So uh, they tell me they're going to spend about, oh, 20, 20, 30 minutes talking about the book and what they found, and then they'll open up for some Q&A after that. So join me in welcoming Kenton Bird and John Pierce. Thank you, Cornell, for that kind introduction, and uh, thanks all of you for being here today. It's really an honor for me to be back at WSU, where I earned my PhD, but also where my friendship and collaboration with John Pierce began. And uh, in uh, 1994, after Tom Foley's defeat from uh, his uh, lost his seat in Congress. Um, I was forming a PhD committee, and uh, John graciously agreed to be on it, and uh, uh, we have uh, been a part of this uh, uh, long-running study of uh, Speaker Foley uh, almost ever since, with uh, 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 a gap of a few years, and then picked up a, a few few bits of, uh, uh, ago. Um, our book actually has nine chapters. And uh, to, we're not going to give you the whole story. We hope you'll buy the book and uh, <laughs> read uh, a little bit more. But there are three chapters that I think are particularly relevant. Um, you can get there from here is uh, a little bit about uh, how Tom Foley uh, came to be elected, to be reelected, to rise in the leadership of Congress. Uh, the man in the middle. Uh, is the title of the book and how uh, we came up uh, with an analytical framework to understand uh, Tom Foley's congressional career. And finally, The Perfect Storm uh, describes uh, uh, Foley's uh, final campaign and uh, electoral defeat in uh, 1994. Uh, but I'm going to pause here and uh, turn over to, to John. We're going to sort of tag team uh, today. And John can just tell a, a little bit about how this project came about, how uh, the two of us came to uh, work together, uh, first on the, the dissertation and, and then on the, the book itself. I, I too am glad to be here. And my first time at WSU was on before most of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> we, we came here in uh, 73, right? Yeah. This is my wife, Arleth, here. And, uh, she got her PhD from WSU in the School of Education in uh, um, Educational Administration and has been uh, principal of many of the best schools in the country. Uh, so uh, we now live in St. Louis after having gone to uh, Colorado Springs and then to Portland 
and then to Lawrence, and, uh, <laughs> and then to St. Louis, mostly following our family. Uh, we have two sons. Uh, one's on the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis. He's an he's endowed professor in the School of, Bu school of Business. He studies uh, organizational ethics. Uh, the other one's on the School of Music at the University of Kansas, um, where his father loves what to watch basketball. Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, we live about uh, a 10 minute walk from Allen Fieldhouse, which is another one of the titular places in the, in the country. So. But always we have thought about uh, Pullman as our family's home. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really is a pleasure to, to be back here again. And uh, we've, dr we've driven through on s several occasions and uh, uh, not had a, time, a chance to spend time on the campus in all these new places <laughs> like here. Um, our, um, uh, Ken, as Ken indicated, I was on his uh, doctoral dissertation committee, and then I left, um, and not because of that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And then um, that's when we went to uh, Colorado Springs. And then, um, but uh, we stayed connected, and then often when I came back to the Northwest, we have a place uh, in the mountains, an off-the-grid place in the mountains, up north of Sandpoint, Idaho. Uh, and so we do uh, mini hydro and solar and stuff, and outhouses and, uh, and all the rest. Uh, so sometimes we're down here, sometimes he goes, uh, he knows Idaho really well, and sometimes he's up there, and then uh, we get together and we talk about things, including uh, this particular manuscript. Um, the, um, the story of how it, it got to its concrete presence uh, back there is uh, is a long one. It took us a long time. It probably was eight years from the time we first mentioned it to each other, and uh, then we just sort of bounced around in our heads. But we really didn't have a uh, a concrete proposal and uh, a concrete place to go with it. Then when I was on the University of Kansas campus. Uh, a close friend of mine, the uh, late Burdett Loomis, who was a well-known uh, congressional scholar, uh, and uh, he and I were talking, and uh, he edited for KU Press a uh, series on congressional leadership. And he said, well, John, you're a, he was a congressional fellow also. He said, well, why don't you do a book on uh, Tom Foley? And I said, well, only if I can ask somebody else to do it with me. Because that's a big project, and I didn't want to fly all over the country doing interviews and stuff. And, and I remembered uh, Kenton's uh, dissertation, and so I don't know. At some point, we crossed paths, and uh, uh, I invited him to join me. And then I checked with Bert, and he said that was great. And uh, um, and so then we started this uh, long trek <laughs> through uh, Tom Foley's political career and the people with whom he worked and knew him well, including other members of the Washington delegation, who uh, they've been all were still alive from, from that point. And uh, the, now they're scattered around the, around, the, around the country. And other people who were in the House at that time and in the leadership, who, uh, uh, who was it we talked to in France? Jim McDermott. Yeah, Jim McDermott. He was, oh, he, he was really <laughs> complaining because during the COVID pandemic, he was isolated in uh, rural France. <laughs> he said, this is real tough. And we, um, and we uh, uh, so then, then we, we sort of divvied up the, uh, um, the responsibilities after we agreed on kind of an outline for the book. Uh, and uh, Kenton was able to rely on his previous work and then expanding it, and I was able to rely on his previous work, <laughs> but also my experience in the, in the House when I was a congressional fellow. I was at Tulane University at that point, uh, and um, as a faculty member, and then uh, Artif and I went to DC, and uh, I, they uh, traditionally, not always, but traditionally the fellowship program, which I recommend to any of you, if for students especially. If it's for faculty, but there are other ones like that. Um, you spend half a, half a year in the House and half in the Senate. And so 
Um, I spent half the year in the office of Frank Church and uh, half in the office of Tom Foley. And um, it was because I, I had grown up in Washington State and I loved the Northwest and I always wanted to uh, get back here. And uh, we, it hadn't happened yet, but we thought it might. And so uh, there was, it was not uh, manipulative, but I did want to uh, uh, serve somebody from the Northwest or the Midwest. I went to graduate school in Minnesota, so I interviewed uh, with uh, Hubert Humphrey. Oh well. my gosh, I didn't know that. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But, uh, uh, and that, that's a, you know, that, Hubert Humphrey was often made fun of. Mm. Uh, I, had a, I had an interview with him uh, in the uh, National Geographic office because it was right after he, before he was back in the Senate, but he had been there before. And, uh, and he had been on the faculty of the University of Minnesota where I got my doctoral degree. And uh, I, I came out of there thinking he was one of the most brilliant people I'd ever met. He, is, he was a, a terrific uh, intellect. And we had a good talk, uh, and I could understand some of it. And, the, <laughs> and, and one of the, he gave some insights in, into Congress for me, too. Uh, one of them was when uh, he said, <clears throat> after he was reelected, but before he was um, officially part of the Senate, he went in and walked through the Senate chamber. <laughs> and he, uh, he ran into a very conservative uh, member from uh, the South who said, Hubert, it's so wonderful to have you back. You bring so much humanity to the Senate. And uh, that always stuck with me because some of the other stuff we did, like uh, the book on civility and, and Don Foley, who uh, are civil, but they want to make things work. And uh, so, um, <coughs> we then, um, uh, after uh, uh, Bert Loomis uh, uh, got the okay to go ahead, then we, uh, we started working on the project. And uh, this, this was the result, uh, the man in the middle. And that wasn't our immediate uh, title. I mean, it was after we sort of went through and induced that uh, from uh, everything we had come to say, have to say because the things about which were most distinctive about his career in the House. And those distinctive elements became even more crucial this past year, uh, you know, with the, the speaker now. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> Mike Johnson. <laughs> Mike, yeah, Mike Johnson. <laughs> and, and that's ironic because uh, Arthur and I were in uh, New Orleans for five years, so we know the, the uh, Louisiana culture well and uh, you know and he um, um, and he's having his problems and, uh, uh, and the um, uh, I don't know how many of you know this that to be speaker uh, you don't have to be a member of Congress uh, <laughs> but I turned it down <laughs> the, um, uh, but, uh, you know, it was a long period before Johnson became speaker, you know, with the, and then the, the, the conflicts and challenges he's had since then in terms of trying to wrestle with uh, uh, unwrestlable uh, freedom caucus. Yeah, freedom caucus and, and the rest. And, and so um, um, that, that basically was uh, how we did it. I mean, he worked out here, Kenton worked out here. Uh, I did a lot of work in uh, St. Louis where we were, uh, uh, we were temporarily <coughs> there, we're not there permanently. And uh, it was, uh, uh, but that was Gephardt's location. And so we had a nice uh, telephone conversation with him and uh, he was very insightful as well. And so then we got the, we got the we got the book done, and uh, the um, and as you know, you know, and has is that we have up there the political career. Some of that early stuff uh, really was um, 
indicative of what his career was going to be like, perhaps none more than the Democratic Study Group, which was an organization of Democrats, mostly young progressive Democrats, who uh, uh, basically were a majority of the Democrats at that point. And uh, at some point he was, head of, he was the chair of that. And, uh, the, um, and many of the reforms that he uh, proposed and helped push through at that point ended up changing the structure uh, of the committee system and the power structure in there. So uh, the, um, and that's how we that's how we got here. We uh, uh, I, I, I might might say one anecdote is that when we we'd done uh, uh, a draft of it or draft a part of it and met with the uh, editor uh, of the uh, press there, <laughs> not for that, but somebody else. Uh, he said, uh, basically, he said, this is much too favorable. <laughs> you know, he's, and I said, you know, that's the way it was. You know, everybody you talked to had nothing to say but good things about him, about Tom Foley. And, uh, and I had my own good experiences with him, and I'll just tell one of them sit down, but uh, the, uh, the, while I was there, he invited me to go out to lunch with him one day, and we went out and had a nice lunch, and then on the way back, he said, John, I've got a, there's an emergency boat on the floor, I've got to go up and into, onto the house, and we were in his car, which was a gorgeous uh, black uh, Mercedes convertible, <laughs> and uh, he said, take this and park it down in the parking lot which I'd never been in, but he says it's down in, uh, in the basement of the, uh, uh, of the Capitol building. I said, okay. <laughs> and I uh, didn't, I managed to scrape it uh, on the side. <laughs> so I went back, I went, up, went back and talked to Heather, his wife, who was working in his office at the time. I said, Heather, uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, scratched it in the uh, car. She says, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and, it, and it turned out that each said we have a dinner, a formal dinner uh, the next night. There'll be a whole bunch of people sitting at the table with us, and I'll tell them in front of those <laughs> people. <laughs> and uh, then I, uh, uh, the next morning, uh, I, you know, I came into the office, and uh, then he came in and he walked over to the Don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> so there you go. So you guys have to say now. <laughs> I can't talk that sort of <laughs> I'm going to go light on the biographical material, but I, I wanted to have this slide up so that you could see the, the symmetry of Foley's career, that he was elected in 1964. He came into office uh, on the coattails of Lyndon Johnson, who was the incumbent president uh, running for election for the first time. Uh, so that was 60 years ago, uh, 1964. And his time in Congress ran through the presidency of Bill Clinton in uh, 1994, uh, which was 30 years ago. So this is a, um, both a 60th and a, a 30th anniversary for scholars of Tom Foley. And uh, I uh, wanted to say just a little bit about uh, the 5th Congressional District because part of our book looks at the relationship between Foley and his constituents. And uh, I think this is significant because uh, you see the original boundaries of the district um, ran uh, east and west from the crest of the Cascades uh, to the Idaho border. Uh, from the Canadian border south to the south border of Spokane County. And so the first three times that Tom Foley ran, uh, that was uh, the district. And then the Republicans who had control of the redistricting process in the state legislature thought, well, we're going to shuffle Tom Foley's district and make it easier for a Republican to win the 5th District, and so they took away the Apple Country, the North Cascades, uh, OMAC, uh, Okanagan, and uh, added Whitman County, Walla Walla County, uh, Asotan County, so the district flipped from being horizontal to vertical, and uh, that was in effect for the 1972 election. So when 
you came to WSU in 1973, you were in Foley's district. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and that was the beginning of a, a wonderful partnership uh, between this university and, and Tom Foley, because there you can walk around this campus and there are lots of places that were supported by uh, appropriations that uh, uh, the 5th uh, District's congressman had, uh, had his fingerprints on. So uh, I have a couple slides uh, that came from the Foley papers at uh, WSU. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to show in particular uh, the horse, uh, this horse that uh, has no name uh, but plays an important part in Foley's career. And this was in the late 1960s uh, when uh, Foley's district included uh, OMAC, a home of the OMAC Stampede, one of the largest and oldest rodeos uh, in Washington State. And uh, this was not taken uh, uh, at contemporaneously, it was a few years later, but uh, this is one of uh, my favorite Tom Foley stories uh, that he told and retold many times. And uh, he says, th so there was a parade. They brought up 50 riders representing the OMAC, Okanagan Sheriff's Posse, all carrying American flags. And I thought, this has got to be slow. I was told that we were going to go around the ring a couple of times with this very large cavalry. Instead, they all went off again at full gallop. I got caught up in the group. Suddenly, I found my horse, this horse, going counterclockwise <laughs> to a general clockwise di direction of the posse. And suddenly, I'm out there in the, the arena all alone. The posse had disappeared through the chutes. I'm struggling to get control of one rein that's been lost and a stirrup that somehow disappeared under the horse's belly. There was general guffawing and hooting and applauding and so on. Uh, Dick Larson, who was my administrative assistant, told me, that was wonderful. What do you mean, Foley said. I made a fool of myself. <coughs> exactly, Larson said. That's exactly what you did, and it's just terrific. You proved that you were Spok from Spokane, that you couldn't ride worth a damn, <laughs> but you got out there and made them feel good about the fact that they could. <laughs> <laughs> You'll win this county. <laughs> I predict it. And uh, Foley said, I did. So that's an example of, of Foley's uh, ability to poke fun at himself, to connect with constituents, and to be a, a good sport. So I, I'm going to skip uh, ahead just a little bit here. I want to uh, show um, uh, this is the, uh, the thesis of the book. And uh, uh, with John's help, we have six points uh, that speak to uh, what we call Tom Foley's middleness, his quality of being able to uh, reach out to both sides, uh, to be an intermediary, to be a conciliatory leader, uh, and to negotiate compromises. Uh, so, uh, first of these, Tom Foley was a transitional leader. Uh, and uh, you see in, in this image uh, the three House speakers who preceded him, uh, Carl Albert, Tip O'Neill, and uh, Jim Wright. Uh, they're part of this long string of Democratic speakers that date back to the 1940s. Uh, so Foley was the last Democratic speaker uh, before Nancy Pelosi, and uh, between Foley and Pelosi there was a, uh, a series of Republicans, uh, none of whom lasted uh, very long, and then since Pelosi's second time as speaker, we, we've had uh, three speakers so far, I think. Um, so uh, he's uh, in, in the middle there. Foley was largely an institutionalist in that he believed in Congress uh, as a supreme uh, lawmaking body uh, that uh, he devoted his life and career to. And his distinctive personal background and uh, values uh, were part of who he was as uh, a, a junior member of Congress, as a, a committee chair, 
and uh, then uh, in the, the leadership of the House. Um, uh, this is one of my uh, favorite pictures uh, when Foley was still Speaker and he's got, he's grimacing uh, because that's Newt Gingrich uh, uh, raising some point of order or some uh, parliamentary complaint and Foley probably wishes he could have been anywhere else except in the Speaker's chair that day. Um, John mentioned that uh, Tom Foley had been a, a very active uh, reformer uh, as the chair of the Democratic Study Group in the 1980s, which really reshaped the, the committee structure and the, uh, the way that the House did business. Uh, and then uh, uh, when he became speaker, though, he was, again, he's an institutionalist. He, he's in this role of defending Congress uh, against the critics. So uh, particularly with uh, things like the House Bank uh, and uh, the House Post Office, uh, which are minor scandals that we, we talk about in the book. Uh, he, he sort of uh, took a go-slow approach to reform. <coughs> and then finally, leading into uh, 1994, he, he's caught between uh, the, the conservative values of the 5th District and the increasingly liberal Democratic caucus. And so he, he's in the middle. He's trying to, to moderate uh, his uh, positions. And uh, John, do you want to say a little bit more about the, the, the middleness? Uh, are there uh, things that... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, uh, I'm going to skip ahead uh, past uh, uh, some of the things that went on in, in 94, but I, I wanted to come back to this quote from uh, Bruce Reed, uh, originally from Coeur d'Alene. Um, he was a domestic policy advisor uh, to President uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, we talked to him uh, about uh, Foley's leadership qualities, and uh, he had this, uh, the, the middleness, he understood that, a long way from the center of the House Democratic Caucus to the center of the country, even though Washington uh, is uh, on, on the coast, the, the 5th District was more of a heartland uh, district. And he said, Speaker Foley just had to straddle two horses. And uh, that brought back uh, uh, the, the metaphor of the OMAC stampede, where he's trying to, to straddle one horse and get out of the arena without uh, embarrassing himself. So uh, some of you uh, may remember Matt Crow, a uh, farmer from Garfield, a member of the WSU Board of Regents, uh, chair of, uh, of Farmers for Foley. Uh, and uh, uh, when I interviewed him, he told what happened with the, the agricultural support for Foley. And he said, I can go down the list of farmers in Whitman County and check off the dads and, and moms who were for Foley and the kids who were not. Uh, that uh, those who uh, had been born uh, in the 70s and 80s didn't know Tom Foley the way that uh, people who uh, had, were of his generation and that uh, that uh, uh, was a factor in uh, Foley's electoral de defeat. And I'm going to uh, show you the, the results here. Uh, George Nethercutt, uh, a Spokane uh, attorney, uh, had 50.9% um, of the vote. Uh, Tom Foley had 49.1%. Um, and uh, uh, so it was uh, less than 4,000 votes out of 200,000 votes cast. And um, uh, if there had been a shift of just several dozen votes in the largest counties uh, in, if, if, uh, in different precincts, Foley probably could have made up that difference. But uh, as it was, uh, he would have not been speaker because the Republicans picked up 54 seats that year. It was a really big swing from uh, uh, they got the majority of 230, and the Democrats had only 204 seats. And so um, even if he had been returned to represent the 5th District, he would not have been the Speaker. 
and uh, we think Tom Foley would not have been happy uh, in that minority uh, of Democrats, particularly considering who became Speaker, uh, and uh, that was Newt Gingrich, of, of course, so it, it wouldn't have been a, a pleasant time for Foley. Nonetheless, uh, he did not uh, uh, abandon public life after his defeat. Uh, the Foley Institute, and, uh, which uh, sponsors programs like this, has been around uh, since 1995, so it'll have its uh, 30th anniversary next year. Um, President Clinton appointed uh, him to be the U.S. Ambassador to <coughs> uh, where he served with honor from 1997 to 2001. Uh, this photo taken in 2001 when the federal courthouse and uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Post Office building in downtown Spokane uh, renamed in his honor. Uh, Tom Foley died in October of 2013 in Washington, D.C., and was buried in the Congressional Cemetery just uh, east of his home on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, so some things that uh, we learned uh, in uh, the course of this research, um, John mentioned uh, that our initial manuscript was so positive uh, that the editor was skeptical. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, 20 years after uh, I did my ori original research, uh, that uh, we still could not find anybody who would be even mildly critical of him. I mean, some people uh, raise questions of, well, maybe he could have run the, the 94 campaign a little differently or spent more time in the district. Um, it was clear from uh, what we looked uh, at uh, the, the district that uh, the people of Eastern Washington, the voters, have become more conservative, um, and uh, a, a variety of factors, both regionally and nationally, have made it harder uh, to be a moderate like Tom Foley was. Um, so just to sum up, Foley's greatest accomplishments uh, were his ability to find middle ground and uh, uh, in various political arenas between Congress and the White House, and you see him uh, with, uh, he, here he is in the middle. So many of these photos, um, <laughs> Tom Foley is in the center. And that's uh, Robert Michael, his friend and longtime Republican leader from Illinois, and uh, George H.W. Bush, and they've all got a, a big grin on their face, uh, probably because Tom Foley had just told a joke. <laughs> Uh, between uh, the 5th District and the national leadership within the Democratic Caucus and between the parties in, in the House. And uh, President Obama spoke at uh, Foley's memorial service uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, describes Tom Foley uh, as uh, someone with deep integrity, with a powerful intellect, and ability to find common ground. And it was his personal decency that helped him bring civility and order to a Congress that demanded both and still does. And that's as true in 2024 as it was uh, in 2013. So uh, we'll close with uh, our appreciation to the Foley Institute for uh, making this possible to our friends uh, in uh, mask at the WSU library. And I did want to acknowledge uh, Heather Foley, Tom's wife, pictured uh, with him uh, on the steps of the, the Capitol early in his time in Congress, who has been unfailingly supportive. She's opened doors, she's made contacts, um, she's given lots of good information that uh, found its way into the, the book. So uh, we send our greetings and appreciation to, to Heather. And uh, I think that's the point we can stop. I hope we... I've got a couple other things. Now, now I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to, to John and let him make some additional observations. This, this description of Tom Foley is in the middle makes him seem maybe easy and soft and uh, um, Mule, but uh, he, he was tough on the stuff he believed in, and there were some very difficult questions that uh, people thought would cost him his seat. Uh, 
for example, uh, the NRA. Uh, he, after there was a shooting at uh, Fairchild, was at Fairchild in Spokane, uh, he came out and supported strongly the limitations of, on arms. Uh, and the NRA, which had been a supporter for a long time, and to which he had belonged for a long time, uh, rejected him there. And that, we don't know how many votes that cost him, but it surely cost him some, and they were public with that. Uh, there was another one, NAFTA, North American Free, Ta Free Trade Act, which was opening uh, trade doors between the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. And his strong union supporters in Spokane and some of his own leadership cadre uh, uh, opposed his position on it. He supported NAFTA, both because in principle what he felt about free trade, but also because it was the White House position. And he thought it was his responsibility mm -hmm. as leader of the Democrats in Congress to support the president of his party. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of things were, uh, uh, were important to him, even though all along he was very transactional in terms of specific kinds of benefits to his district. Look at the dams, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, look at the irrigation districts and, uh, and so on. You know, he did, he did his job as a, a delegate for the interests of his his constituency, but that's not all he did because he w he was a, a ethical intellectual uh, politician, and so uh, and I think all who knew him really thought uh, that was uh, the truth about him. Uh, Kenton's right; there never was any um, um, uh, dispute about his qualities. In fact, one of the when I first was in uh, uh, in Washington D.C. and I was talking to another congressional fellow, and this was in 1973, I think it was, and we were in the house and we were just in the hallway uh, gossiping, and uh, he said, who, "Who are you working for?" And I said, "Tom Foley." He said, "Oh, great. My my member, the person I'm working for from California, said Tom Foley will be speaker one day." And that was amazingly prescient, and, uh, and he was, and he was uh, a great, and the reviews of this book and of Tom Foley uh, uh, second that. Uh, they, one, one reviewer says, uh, an obscure uh, <laughs> member of Congress from Eastern Washington, uh, Tom <coughs> Foley, and then he says, but, you know, he was among the best ever. So uh, that's 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 where we should leave it. Uh, well, he also did some other things like uh, you know, like the uh, draft cards and the flag burning, and he opposed putting uh, you know, the flag in the Constitution because he thought that was not the right thing to do. And so uh, there were some who said when he became speaker, he backed off from some of those right things because of the responsibility to bring the Democrats together and the, uh, the change in the parties in their, from when he went in. But nonetheless, he was a, he was a good speaker, a, a good politician, and I think a great man. So, I'm done. Okay. So, question? Yeah, some time for uh, questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question I have is, what do you think, besides the 1994 election, was Foley's greatest challenge in his political career? Well, I think managing his relationship with the diverse Republican interests in his constituency. Uh, and there was a kind of sorting going on across lots of Republican and conservative districts where uh, it was being more clear uh, that uh, you did it because of more ideology uh, and uh, less because of the goods. And, and there was, as one of the, the people that we talked to said, it's amazing how many people voted against him not knowing what he had done for the district over the years, uh, whether it was courthouses or dams or, or whatever, or not caring about it, so, or farm supports and all these things that really buttress the, uh, um, the economy of the district. Mm -hmm. so. 
Another challenge was as he rose in leadership, he had to spend more time in Washington, D.C. because uh, um, he was uh, often the Democratic spokesperson uh, responding to a presidential speech. Um, he needed to be close to uh, the center of power, uh, which meant he couldn't come back to Spokane and Pullman and Clarkston and Colfax a, as often. Uh, and uh, I think there was a perception in the last few years, well, that Tom Foley's just gotten too big for uh, the district, that, uh, you know, he doesn't care about his constituents. And of course, he cared about his constituents, but he had this national leadership uh, position that uh, uh, required his, his time and attention. Um, he compensated uh, for that limitation by having extremely talented and long-serving staff. Uh, so the Spokane office, the Walla Walla office, both had long-time people who really knew the district and whenever he came back you know, were able to, to prep him uh, for um, the going to the Whitman County wheat growers or uh, spending time at the uh, VA hospital in, in well, well, you know, One of the maps we have in the book shows where he went when he came back and going around the district in a huge district and, you know, and driving between different towns and meeting with yeah. the editor of the uh, uh, the old Matt Chronicle. <laughs> yeah, when or the, the district white tech, uh, wizard or something. You know? <laughs> the Dayton Chronicle. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and that made it tough as well. And then uh, the continual uh, squeezing of the middle. Uh, and, uh, and so, anybody else? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I wonder if you comment a little bit. He was a man in the middle of in another way as well. It wasn't just the polarization that was taking place and the changing ideological composition of rural areas. It was also a changing norms in Congress itself. Be you know, my favorite story he, he used to tell, well, actually, it, at his memorial service, at the most moving tribute was, was Bob Michaels, mm -hmm. who was in tears, talking about his friend Tom Foley and telling his stories how they would meet every week and they would alternate offices, the, the speaker's office or the, the minority leader's office to talk about what they were going to do that week. And that kind of collegial norms really evaporated with Newt Gingrich, right? And, and on purpose, I mean, Newt Gingrich didn't like that. He, he wanted a much more combative uh, House of Representatives. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. You're right. <laughs> That's a little bit. <laughs> well, I can say a little bit about Gingrich um, because uh, there's an excellent uh, book called Burning Down the House. Uh, um, and that, that was Gingrich's strategy was to uh, destroy the institution so he could uh, rebuild it in his mold. And that meant uh, that Republican candidates and Republican incumbents had to to demonize their opponents, uh, that they, they couldn't be friends. Uh, I mean, here, we had a great example here in Washington State, Sid Morrison in the 4th District uh, served uh, with, with Foley in the 5th District. And they were good, good pals. They, they worked together uh, on uh, lots of legislation to benefit uh, Eastern Washington. I think WSU has his papers as well. I think so, yeah. But uh, Sid Morrison wasn't comfortable in the, the Gingrich-led house because of the, the need to, uh, to pull together as Republicans and uh, uh, circle the wagons and, and not uh, uh, fraternize with the, the, the Democrats. And ironically, shortly after Fully became speaker. Gingrich was reasonably favorable to him. We have we have some nice quotes from him. About, mm -hmm. You know, he didn't agree with him, but he's a good person and all of that. But that left him uh, before. Yeah. Nicholas, do you think we'll ever get back to that kind of politics again? Do you think we? All the changes in social media and then in the way independent funding of campaigns and Citizens United and all that stuff, do you think we'll ever get back to where people actually prefer the man in the middle when they see him on the ballot, man or woman? I was asked uh, this question by the Inlander of Spokane when they uh, did a, a little um, review of the, the book. And the, the example I gave 
uh, was there's a group called the Congressional Problem Solvers Caucus. Yes. Uh, it, and uh, it's in the House, and uh, it has about 40 members uh, who are both uh, evenly divided between re Republicans and Democrats. And uh, if anybody leaves, uh, they have to be replaced by somebody from the same party, and you, they don't want an imbalance. And they've done some good work on technology, on trade, uh, on uh, some of the procedural issues. But you know, 40 out of 435 is is not going to make a, a huge difference. But th there there is maybe a glimmer of hope there. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. But the, the question, another question is. Could Foley get reelected? Could someone like him get reelected from those districts? And uh, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> so, but the, the the challenge for the there are three Democratic women uh, running uh, for Foley's seat uh, this year. Kathy McMorris Rogers, the uh, incumbent, is uh, stepping down after 20 years in, in the House, and. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, those Democratic challengers are positioning themselves uh, uh, to win the primary, so they're appealing to the Democratic base and then they're going to have to slide back to the, the middle for the, the general election. Um, I, I could see a scenario that if the Republicans nominate someone from the Trump wing uh, of the party, that there might be enough uh, moderates uh, independents, uh, Democrats, and um, uh, never Trump Republicans who might give the nod to the uh, the Democrats. Well, who's the Republican nominee going to be? Yeah, <laughs> we we don't know. And, yeah, we uh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Matt, I just you. wanted to point out, particularly for the students, um, to understand the the best thing I have have seen uh, to understand the impact of the of the Gingrich Revolution in the post Foley period. Steve Kornacki from MSNBC did a series of podcasts about a year ago, and it was very thorough and very clear about how deliberately uh, he was determined to undo the relation, the existing relationships yeah. within Congress, and, and really change the culture of the place. And it's never come back. Yeah. It's never come back. It's a really well done series. Really well worth listening to. Well, Gingrich's argument is that's why. Republicans were in the minority for so long so yep. because yeah. they bought into bipartisanship. Okay. Yeah. But another example of how much Tom was respected by those on the other side is the fact that George Nethercutt is now on the Foley Institute's board. Yeah. <laughs> and the Nethercutt Foundation has been folded into the, the Foley Institute. So, <clears throat> so he was he was respected by those he who he defeated <laughs> and those who beat him. Well, so. it's just like when he <laughs> defeated uh, Horan. Yeah. Uh, you know, Thirty years, years earlier, yeah, yeah, he, uh, uh, he had a little party for him. Or something, <laughs> you know, they, uh, yeah, he was a good. He was, uh, he was the best. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, uh, Alex, I yeah, want both of you to address um, fully in reference to the Cold War, and my context for that is uh, very young faculty member involved in Fulham Sand, which was very much a, uh, a group. They were worried about um, uh, 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 a nuclear Armageddon, uh, the uh, and actually had an episode of meeting Tom Foley and and and, and Heather in uh, uh, in D.C. But the context there was simply your sense of how he basically negotiated Cold War issues uh, and the kind of armament issues. Uh, uh, during his speaker. Well, I should begin by saying that Tom Foley's mentor was Senator Henry Jackson, who was one of the, uh, the coldest uh, of the cold warriors in, in, in the Senate. So I think in those early years, uh, Jackson had uh, a lot of influence uh, on Foley's position uh, on uh, nuclear weapons, on defense policy, and, and the confrontation with the Soviets. But I, I sense a, a mellowing um, by the, the 70s after uh, Jackson's uh, death um, that uh, Foley became um, much more receptive to 
um, the, the people who were advocating for, uh, say, a nuclear freeze in uh, the 70s and 80s, and he enthusiastically embraced uh, the, the detente that uh, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev uh, achieved in the, the late uh, 1980s. Anything that? No. Nope. Uh, uh, and I, I would say one case of Foley's uh, receptivity to constituent concerns on uh, foreign policy uh, originated here in Pullman, and uh, uh, Walt Miller is uh, here in the audience today, was part of the Coalition for Central America, uh, which pushed Foley to take a tougher position on the U.S. relationship with El Salvador uh, in the, the 1990s, and that uh, Foley actually, uh, I think, got out in front on that issue in response to uh, constituent activities. Uh, he appointed a, a select committee to investigate the murders of the Jesuit priests at uh, the University of El Salvador, and that led and within months to the U.S. terminating military aid to mm -hmm. El Salvador. So I, I think by the near, near the end of his, his time in the House, he was, um, I, I think, uh, less hawkish and uh, more in, in the center on a lot of those foreign policy issues. Time for one more question, I think. Uh, I had a quick one following up on a question you had a moment ago. And I'm thinking of uh, the Disagree Better campaign started by the governor of Utah. He's uh, got the governor of Colorado to join in with him on that. It seems like the two of them, in the wake of Gingrich maybe, the big, long, expansive wake of Gingrich, don't see that as necessitating any move toward the middle on their behalf, just sort of rejecting the Trump style of it's, yeah, combat More stylistic than so. What might you or Tom Foley say um, to those who would say who would suggest maybe a move to the middle uh, might befit um, that effort better? It's hard to say uh, anything critical of civility, anything that <laughs> would would get people talking to each other, uh, not uh, moving away from name calling. Um, um, if even if it's just uh, stylistic, if we could have those conversations again. Uh, and starting to find the, the common ground, find the, uh, that uh, middle territory uh, where we could make some um, um, policy decisions and uh, disagree uh, on the issues without being disagreeable. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think there's potential there. So, do you want to give Nicholas the, okay. uh, the last word? Uh, he uh, always gets the last word. So. <laughs> one, one, one more short question. Um, for everybody in public administration, our, our uh, teaching is that you serve whoever is in power uh, without a bias, and you do your job and you carry out your, your duties. It becomes increasingly difficult to do that when, when the, the politics is so divided and so partisan. So one of the things Tom Foley was noted for is to encourage young people to go into the public service, go into um, uh, uh, work on behalf of the people that are paying the bills and paying the taxes. Do you think we can we can encourage with the, with reading your book people to say, I want to see more about the process and how a person in the middle can make it all work? Is that one in ten of the book? I hope. Well, I, I think a couple things. Uh, one is, you know, the worrisome uh, stuff in the papers about uh, if Trump is elected, you know, wanting to fire people and change, it, it, it intentionally change the, uh, the tenor of uh, Washington <coughs> and that. It would be much more difficult if that happens. Um, the other thing I was going to say, I forget, but <laughs> it was, it, was uh, um, it depends on the, on the policy question as well, and whether they can, they can abstract it out of policy disputes into more of a tenor of a conversation. And I think it's more possible. And then maybe some long-term, you know, politics, you know, trade-offs and exchanges and all the rest. 
Let me just say, um, be, before we thank our guests, um, one of the things we were doing at the Institute to recognize Tom Foley's uh, commitment to public service and how important he thought an ethic of public service was, is we've established this year um, a Distinguished Public Service Award, which we're giving out to Jim Mattis on April 9th up in Spokane. Um, and we'll be giving that out annually in the future. So, so I encourage you to come up to that uh, event as well. Let me, uh, before we thank our guests, let me remind you we have an event at 4.30 with, with Justice Stevens this afternoon, if you want to come back for that. There's going to be pizza again. I don't, <laughs> I might not want pizza twice in the same day, but there'll be pizza for that event as well. And now, uh, join me, oh, let me also remind you, uh, those of you who want to purchase a book and have it signed by the authors, we'll have some in, available in the front uh, foyer there. So uh, now, uh, join me in thanking Kenton and John for a really fascinating discussion.